Let's, uh, let's jump right in uh, this morning. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we go into the text. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for Christ Jesus, our Savior. Our oh, Lord, we're here today once again asking that You feed us that heavenly bread, precious food, food that lasts to eternal life, that does not spoil. Father, may we, through Your Word today, hear Christ and Him crucified and Him raised and Him glorified for us, for our forgiveness, for our service ever new unto You. We need You, Lord. Forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We have been looking here in Ephesians 6 how in the midst of the fight, as we have been describing our lives, particularly the Christian life, we have said that it is a fight. That life, when we really look at it with discernment, we realize that it is not a playground. If we want to use a metaphor, we realize that life is not just a playground, but it is a battleground. It is um, years of, uh, of struggle in which there are many moments of great joy and happiness, right? Great moments uh, of goodness that God allows us by His grace. But we, should not, we have said that we should not lose sight of the fact that there is an enemy that intends to do us harm, and that we can stand faithfully against this enemy. And the enemy is rendered then powerless when we stand in the fight in the way that God wants us to stand. And how is that? We have said when we stand by faith in, in, in confidence, ever-growing, ever-renewing confidence in the person and the work of Christ for us. We have said that that is what the armor of God is about. That it has to do with a person and the work of Christ for us. That's why in Ephesians 6, we have said the following in verse 14. It says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist, with truth. It talks about a belt of truth that is the truth of the grace of God in Christ Jesus for us. What pulls our life and all the pieces of our life all together. What causes us who oftentimes find ourselves broken and shattered into a million pieces and we realize that we don't have it all together and we suffer and we ache and we struggle, what brings it all together? The good news, the truth, that there is grace for you and me in Christ Jesus. That is the belt of truth. That is the belt that takes all the pieces loose and scattered and pulls it all together so that we may go forward or that we may stand in the grace of God against the attacks of the enemy who is always trying to use all those little pieces and broken places and wounded areas of our lives. Always trying to use all those nasty, ugly little corners of our lives that you and I know about and that the enemy knows about and that God knows about, but God no longer counts it against us. He no longer holds them against us. Matter of fact, He has said, I'm going to take all of your sins and I'm going to throw them at the bottom of the ocean. I will no longer remember them, have memory of them. So what does that? What is able to pull our life together <clears throat> like nothing else? It is not our works. We don't pull our lives together by our works. We don't put our lives together by reforming ourselves. We don't even pull our life together by the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is just that. Fruit. Fruit of what? 
of a life put together. See, we do not come and say, Lord, help me fix my life so that I may come together before You. That's not the way it works. What God does is He proclaims, He declares, You are put together in My love. And as you believe and trust that, you're going to be able to stand. You're going to be able in the face of the enemy, you're going to be able to believe in hope of what I am doing in your life, what I have done for you. And the result of that then is the fruit of the Spirit and good works that adorn our lives and the changes that God brings into our lives. But the essence of that and the way that God pulls all that together and pulls it off in our lives is with this belt of truth, of the truth of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. We have seen the breastplate of righteousness. Notice how all these components, they are different ways of speaking about the same thing. They are different ways, different components of a metaphor to speak about the person and the work of God for us. The belt of truth has spoken about the grace, the truth of the Gospel that pulls our life together. Now, the breastplate of righteousness speaks of a righteousness that God covers me with. That when the enemy wants to come and throw my sins in my face, then when the enemy wants to accuse, when the enemy wants to dirty my life, paralyze me by shame, by sin, by confusion, by weakness, God comes and says, hey, your righteousness is not in yourself. It's not in your works. It's not in what you have done. Look to heavens, to the right hand of God, and see there your righteousness. Christ is your righteousness and he's going to see you through to the end as a breastplate of righteousness it protects all the vital organs now, sometimes our faith might be weak but we have that breastplate that covers us that has us secure in Christ and that's why the saint is always bouncing back up you realize it seems like we're rubber saints because of the breastplate of righteousness because of that breastplate that is not, does not have to do with what I do, but what Christ has done for us, I can always bounce back up. And that would be the fruit of the Spirit. And having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Here's another component. Another way of talking about this person and this work of Christ. It talks about feet and it talks about peace. The peace of God that surpasses understanding. Jesus always, he was, he was fond of saying every time He appeared among His disciples, peace unto you. Right? Every time Jesus appeared in their midst, He spoke of peace. Amen? And that is what the church experiences when we believe by faith the Gospel and what God has done for us. It's as if Christ Himself would appear in our midst and say, My peace be with you. That peace settles our feet. That peace settles our posture in a steadfast way to keep resisting and to keep going forward. Because at the end of the day, I need that peace deep inside. The world is going to be the world. The world will rage. And circumstances in this fallen world may change. They may be good. They may be bad. I myself and the flesh, there's not a lack of bad things there too. But when God speaks to me the peace of the Gospel, then there's peace in my heart to stand another day. And that's all we need. I need to stand today. And that's why God says, my mercies are new for you every day morning. The peace of the Gospel settles our feet on the ground as it did the Roman soldier with those um, shoes that they had to be able to cling on to the ground and not be pushed back. Take the helmet of verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation. Here you have now a helmet that covers your mind. Right? Another way of talking about our salvation in saying, let your mind dwell Meditate, 
think upon the promises of God for you. Let your mind constantly dwell on that which is good and noble and virtuous and of good name and of good report. If anything, praiseworthy. Think on these things, right? That's the Apostle Paul writing to another church, but it's the same idea. In other words, the good thing that we think upon is not a thing, is a person. It's Christ Jesus. Let us think upon Christ. Let us dwell upon Him and all the promises that God has made to us in Christ Jesus. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Where do we find all of these promises? And where has all this been revealed to us? The Word of God. That's why the Apostle Paul here by the Spirit calls it the sword. This is the sword because it contains the thoughts of God, the words of God, the the mind of God revealed to us. And it is what the Spirit uses to clothe us, to keep us safe and secure in the renewing of ourselves in God's armor. I want to point out to you this morning how God does all of this. And it has to do with the centrality of Christ. We began to see last Sunday when we saw in 2 Corinthians. Look to 2 Corinthians for a moment again. And we saw the following. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It's a call to keep our eyes on Jesus. But in a very specific way. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For it is the God (coughs) who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice, it says God shines in our hearts. And then it is that light. What does a light do? What does a light accomplish? Does it... Tell us to think of karma or to think of uh, some of the saints of Eastern religion? Is that what the light does? Does it give us the, um, the chakra? What, are, what is that called? The, uh, you know, when you get that chakra experience, right? Does it give us that? No, it doesn't talk about that. There are many experiences that are false. They're not contained in the Word of God. They're actually of the enemy because... The knowledge that God wants us to dwell upon, to fix your eyes upon, is contained in the face of Jesus Christ. Pastor, I can see His face. How do I do that? He's not. Where do I see Him? Oh, the, fa- the glory of God on the face of Christ is His love and forgiveness for those that acknowledge themselves to be sinners. And in need of Christ, in need of a Savior, is for those that by that knowledge and that revelation of God see themselves as broken before a holy God, acknowledge the one holy God that we have offended. And in the face of Christ, we hear that holy God as a God of mercy, as a God of grace that says to us sinners, look to my Son, Because He is my glory for you. Everything perfect, everything righteous in me, every good work, everything excellent in me, the Son has, and He has done it for you. If you run to Him, then I receive you, the Father says. If you run to Him, then I embrace you in the Son, in all that He has and has done For you, all that he is and all that he has done. If you run to the sun, you can see my glory. A glory that is now for you and not against you. We said last Sunday that the Apostle Paul has been talking about Mount Sinai. If you go back to chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says the following. In verse 7, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, 
so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? You notice there's a lot of um, looking at the face of someone here. The Bible has a lot of looking at the face of someone Okay. Looking at the when you when you talk about relationships, right? You could not possibly have a relationship with someone unless you did what? What have we done? What have we said sometimes to people that we right are dealing with? Hey, why don't you look me in the eye? We're not we're leader. I don't know if the same thing happens to you, but sometimes when people don't haven't you seen sometimes people that don't look you in the eye? Something's fishy, right? And sometimes we ourselves, when we are not very happy or, you know, when we're trying to hide something, what do we do? Oh, okay, thank you, yeah. Oh, good morning. <laughs> right? Something is amiss. There's something not quite right when we can, because this is what God has done. He has given us as people so that we can face each other. Look us in the eye. Right? <clears throat> and have intimacy. Well, God is a person. And God uses the same analogy of relationship to say, if you look me in the eye, you're going to see my glory. If you look me in the eye. But here's a problem. We have read that God appeared in time past on Mount Sinai. Could people look Him in the eye back then? They couldn't. They couldn't. It was a problem there. It says that the children of Israel could not look upon the face of Moses, let alone God. In other words, when they try to look to God, what they saw was darkness, clouds, thundering, lightning. It was a scary sight. It was terrifying. Is it important for us to know God like that? Yes. Let me tell you something about God that we need to know. God is holy. And we're not. God is holy other also. Other than us as creatures. Okay? He's holy, holy, holy. And we are creatures to begin with. We are different from Him. In other words, there is an honor and a majesty to God who is that we, the creatures that created order, do not have. That is why the holy angels, the holy angels that minister before the presence of God, they cover their eyes. As if to say what? When we come before the presence of of the holy God, He wants us to know that He is God and we are not. Notice that we all of a sudden we're talking about great familiarity with God and we're going to get there. But God is interested before we get there for us to know something about Him. The fact that He would look us in the face in Christ Jesus is a miracle. Because what we deserve, when we come before a holy God, we as a creature who have rebelled against His ways and have dared to say, I can be like God. I can manage my own life. I can do whatever I want. I don't care about you, God, the Creator of the heavens and earth. The one that can just blow and I could be evaporated and dissolved. See, God wants us then when we hear the revelation of who He is, to be humbled. To be brought low. To be brought low. That's what humble means. Humble, the word humble in the language, the biblical language means that which which does not rise from the ground. That which does not rise from the ground. So God, before He took us to Christ in the New Covenant... He had a dispensation, a time in history 
where he showed the people who he was as the holy God that no one can look upon his face and live. Because he's holy, because he's different, because he is the creator that is and has always been, and we are not. We're not God. We're not holy like He is. We're not self-existing and self-sustaining like He is. And when we come before Him, all of that representation in the Old Testament of Mount Sinai was meant to say to us, you cannot approach Me unless I come down to you in a way that you can do so. In other words, unless I deal with your sins, unless I set you right with me, I am going to do something to set you right with me because I, the holy other God, the totally pure, everlasting, ever sustaining in Himself, holy other God, wants to look you in the face. Want to look you in the face. And I want you to look me in the face. I want to have intimacy with you. I want to have a relationship with, with you. And all my goodness, I am going to give you as you look me in the face. You notice how this is not a works project. This is a looking in the face of God in Christ kind of project. The reason we are set to work and to do and to serve and to live in the world busily for God is when we first come and look Him in the face. When we simply come and sit at His feet. And He then does what only God can do. And what He has chosen to do by looking unto our faces in Christ Jesus. And then he talks about, we go back here to 2 Corinthians 3, so keep that analogy, that metaphor that God uses, that the Bible uses for our relationship with God. Verse 8 says, see, that was glorious. In other words, back there on Mount Sinai, that was God showing up. Because God is glorious. Now, we had to send a mediator up to the mountain. That was Moses. That's a story from the Old Testament. We didn't want to, the, the people of Israel didn't want to approach because if they approached, they would die. And that's what they came to realize. And they said, Moses, Moses was their leader. Here, leaders always uh, get the short end of the stick, right? <laughs> In a way. It was going to be a glorious moment, but... <clears throat> what would you have done? Me? <clears throat> Why do I have to go up there, right? <clears throat> it was a scary sight. <clears throat> it was a terrifying sight. But then God told Moses, come before me. And I will speak to you face to face. <laughs> yeah. I will speak to you face to face. Now, who was it talking to Moses up there? Christ Jesus, a second person of the Trinity. The glory of God that we can see when God is made, has made a way for us to approach. And the Lamb of God, the Bible says, had already been slain before the foundation of the world. So Christ was there to speak to Moses. He was going to give him his law to show the people what God expected of them. The law, the holy law of God, the Ten Commandments. But that was not going to be the way that God would save them. He was, when God gives and commands His holy law, we realize that we are sinners. And we recoil. We shrink back. But the people did not know yet that Moses was talking to a mediator before them and God. Now, they came to know then, they came to look to Moses as that mediator in the Old Covenant. 
In other words, they had the picture of that spiritual reality that Moses was experiencing in Moses. Obviously, Moses was not their savior, right? But they looked to Moses as their leader, as they go in between themselves and God. And God wanted to teach them that there needs to be a mediator. Because if you appear like that before me, holy God, you die. If you dare to appear like that and say, hey, check me out, Lord God, I'm good, aren't I? I got good works, or, you know, I've done this, or I've done that, or I went to church a few times, or, you know, I got baptized, or I did communion, or I did confirmation, I've been a good person, or whatever, I joined such and such club, I saved animals, I saved humanity, or I saved the manatees. (laughs) Why am I being sarcastic? If you appear before God with your own works, you're going to know the terror of the Lord one day. Because appearing before God on your own works, on your own basis, is saying to God, you have said that I must come before you through a substitute, but I think I am good enough. And I don't need the substitute or the mediator. I had a mediator, some would say. Such and such a saint. Or such and such a patron. I have a mediator. And the Bible says, for there is only one God and one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. Moses was a type of that mediator. The people could not even look to his face because he was full of the glory of of the Lord. God wanted to show and represent to the people how they were to come before Him. It was, it was through a mediator that would be full of the glory of God. But for now, they were tied to a system in which they had to continue to uh, be under until the new covenant would come. And through that system of sacrifices daily and weekly, and in different feasts, and on the Day of Atonement, and through that law that kept on saying to them, you must obey me, they should have been humbled to realize, oh, I'm a sinner, and I need a mediator. I need a sacrifice for my sins. Until the day came when Jesus says, I am the one. When Jesus said one day, I have come to do the will of the Father. I have come to fulfill the law the law of God fully on behalf of my people until finally he cried out, it is finished. He was a substitute. He's the one that lived the perfect life under the perfect law of God that you and I will never ever live and measure up to. And he's the one also that took upon him the death, the penalty for our sins that we owe God He died and He rose again. And upon rising then, He left His disciples and then came back as He had promised in the Spirit. And He said, you go forth now and your ministry is going to be one not now of the letter under the law, but it's going to be one now of the Spirit. In other words, every time you preach the substitute, the mediator, his person, his work, I, by the Spirit, will cause people to see my glory on the face of Christ. And I will pour out my Spirit upon them. I will pour out my Spirit upon them. That's what's happened to us. In 2 Corinthians 3 then, after we read verse 7, um, And we read verse 8, How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Not be more glorious. That one was glorious, yet it was kind of hindered, right? It was kind of of, um, set back in a way by the different uh, physical things and the temple and the sacrifices and the high priest. And the regulations that you have to observe and all of that. 
says that was glorious because it spoke of my glory and my holiness. But what we have now is even more glorious. It's the way of the Spirit. Notice, we don't need a temple with a holy of holies anymore. We don't need a high priest. We don't need a priest for that matter. I'm one of you preaching the Word of God. That's all I do. We don't need an altar. Like in the Old Testament times. We don't need sacrifices. We don't need for you to bring the offerings of old. We don't need the Day of Atonement anymore. We don't need the high feasts anymore. <laughs> what do we need? <laughs> what we need we already have. And that is Christ Jesus crucified and risen for our salvation. And now the Spirit of God through faith comes into our lives and says, Child, I've lived for you and died and bled to save you. We just look to my face now. And when we do, we find the freedom of God. And that's what we read then in, in 2 Corinthians 3 at the end. It says, <clears throat> verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <laughs> That's freedom. From what? From condemnation, number one. No more condemned. No more in prison. No more held back in fear and shame. There's liberty. To what? To look full in His wonderful face. If you're in the Spirit today, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, you have the freedom to look in His face. We don't need Moses from old because we have a better Moses. And this better Moses in the Spirit has pulled back the veil. The curtain was torn up. Remember the curtain? Between the holy and the holy of holies? The curtain was torn up. As, as much as many people today want to sew it back together. I want to say, to come to God you must do this and do that and do this and fix yourself and do this or that. Those are people wanting to sew back the curtain. But hear me out, saints. The curtain, the, the curtain has been rented asunder, has been torn off. The Holy of Holies has been unveiled in Christ Jesus so that whosoever comes to Him now by faith will see the glory of God and will find the freedom of forgiveness of the love of God for us. We will feed on Him and we will be transformed as we feed on Him. It says, verse 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Folks, let me tell you something. The Christian life is not first and foremost about transformation. Pastor, how can you say that? Pastor, let's... You're just going against the grain of so many people say that it's about what I do, my works, my being transformed, the fruit of the Spirit. Hear me out, church. The Christian life is not first and foremost about transformation. It is first and foremost about beholding, looking, considering, the transformation is always the result, the consequent, the derivative, the fruit of the looking upon, of the beholding. The reason you and I do not have more of the transformation and the fruit is because we need to do more of the what? Of the beholding, of the looking upon, of the leaning upon, of the considering of the resting, of the resting in His bosom, of practicing daily our faith, looking unto Jesus. 
Oh, Pastor, what are, let me say that again so I can do it? No, that's not the idea. <laughs> Don't go away with, the, away with another chore to do. That's not what it's about. It's a Father that loves you and it says no matter when and at what time you come, when you come, you're going to see my face radiant, full of glory and delight and satisfaction for you. You belong to me. Every time you come, your soul will be lit ablaze when you come to me through Christ Jesus. And everything you need, you're going to find in my face. I'm going to do it every time you come to me. But what do I need to do? Tell me, what, what, what are the steps? What are the seven steps to have a successful Christian life? What are the things that I must do? Give me the recipe. And the Lord keeps saying, just come. And I'll do the rest. Just come. And look on my face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Interesting, beholding as in a what? In a mirror. In a mirror? Wait a second. The Lord is a mirror? Yeah. Because remember, we said last Sunday, the glory of God in Christ is the glory of God for me. When you come and look to Christ, see, we continue to have this idea of the angry God. The angry, grave God. These cathedrals of old, man, I don't even know how, how you people went there. Christ was scary. The Christ that loomed large over the people in those statues and in those names, it was all, see, all throughout, our time is running out, all throughout the Middle Ages, the middle, spirituality and Christianity throughout the Middle Ages suffer great damage because the people abandoned the Gospel. And it was all, all the rituals, all the, all the arts, all the buildings, it was all, it was all designed to inspire terror upon those coming. Fear upon those coming. The more fear you came with, the more terror you came before God, then the better you would be. You would be in a better state of penitence to receive. Folks, that's the old covenant. We are, have been made ministers of the new covenant. And in the new covenant, we hear, come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in present time of trouble. Now he who has come to know the kindness, the loving kindness and mercy of God is not one that will abuse grace, but it's one that has come to truly know who God is the fierceness of God and His holiness, yet He knows that when He comes through Christ, what He sees is God for me, for Him, and not against me. That is holiness for me, righteousness for me, forgiveness for me, perfection for me, excellence for me, all that God is in Christ. He says, okay, this is all for you. That's why the mirror, see, the mirror. In the mirror as we come, God says, I want you to see who you are in this mirror. But that's not me. But I say that's who you are. You see? He wants us to have a Christ and in Christ identity. But I, I see all these things in me. And what I see in the mirror is Christ's beauty and perfection. And your love upon Him and perfect peace and righteousness. Exactly, saints. That's who you are in Christ Jesus, saints. So then, as we look to our identity in Christ, then it says we are being transformed. You notice how the transformation rests on the looking, the beholding in the mirror, the looking to our identity in Christ, and we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank You. Oh Lord, our time just goes by. These precious truths, Lord, uh, let us take Him home with us. Let us come back on Wednesday. Let the time not be sufficient 
for us to keep pondering them and talking about them and being inflamed in our hearts <coughs> by this precious glory in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Father, I pray that if there's a soul here today that still doesn't know you, I pray that today will be a day of salvation. Let them run to you and be saved. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless your family. It was good sharing with you this morning.